Tudor can do no wrong, or at least they haven't for many, many years. Of all the watches they've released in the last five years, I can only think of one that didn't really hit the mark, and that was the PR1. Tudor is a marketing powerhouse, and without a doubt, probably one of the top three brands in terms of interest and fan support. And it got me thinking, how did they actually get to be so popular? Can they keep it up? How can they improve? And what's next for Tudor? Let's dive in. Tudor has been around since 1926. Ostensibly, they are the sensible working man's alternative to Rolex. This is what Hans Wilsdorf intended, and they have, for the most part, lived up to that corporate mission. For the longest time, Tudor used Rolex components and designs extensively, and this is what explains a lot of the similarities between older Rolexes and Tudors and why they're so pronounced. This essentially continued to a large extent well into the end of the last century and a little bit beyond that. Around 2010-ish, though, things started to change. The Tudor Heritage Chrono was a clear you know, crossing of the Rubicon, where the way Tudor approached their brand and their product lineup changed dramatically. In 2012, they released the Pelagos, which incidentally was the first titanium watch from the Rolex Group. And in 2013, they released the first Heritage Black Bay, which even won a prize at that year's GPHG event. In 2016, they launched their first manufacturer or in-house movements, which made their way into the Black Bay line. I was one of the lucky individuals that owned the original Black Bay, Black Dial, Black Bezel ETA model, which was only in production for a very short time before it was replaced by the in-house version. Since then, we've seen a continued stream of not only new releases, but technological upgrades. We've gotten multiple Black Bays, GMTs, the Black Bay 58 models in a ton of variants, including precious metals, the fixed lug Pelagos FXD, the Datejust-esque Black Bays now with Jubilee-style bracelets, Chronos, the Pelagos 39, and a whole lot more. Why have they succeeded? Well, Black Bay, Black Bay GMT, Pelagos, Pelagos FXD, Marine National, Pelagos 39, Black Bay 58, Black Bay Pro, Black Bay 54, Black Bay Chrono. The overly simplistic and sort of sarcastic answer to that question is that anything called Black Bay or Pelago sells. But in all fairness, Tudor has succeeded because they have offered good watches at good prices at the right time. Starting with the right time. There are a lot of components to this, but think of Panerai. Why did they become so popular in the early 2000s? Well, partially because Sylvester Stallone wore their watches in movies like Daylight and just generally promoted them. But more importantly though, big watches were a thing for a while and Panerai happened to have big watches around the time where that was popular. Tudor really succeeded in bringing out good, vintage-inspired dive watches at exactly the right moment in time. Vintage was a key here. It might not have been Tudor that started the trend, but they definitely were at the cutting edge of it with the Fotina and gilt dials of the original Black Bays. Those design choices with snowflake hands and whatnot proved to strike a nerve in the public. Secondly, just as they were getting even more popular, Tudor struck gold again by understanding that smaller sizes were the way to go. Again, whether or not they were the first movies is worthy of further debate, but the BB-58 and then the Pelagos 39 and finally the BB-54 have proven to be an absolute gold mine in terms of perfect timing for what consumers are looking for. The North Flag may have been a niche favorite, but it was always those vintage style divers and smaller divers that have really moved the needle for Tudor in terms of popularity. And the watches are more or less universally good. Aesthetically, they have often tended to be a little bit on the broadly appealing side. As opposed to Bulgari or Zenith that still tend to go their own way in terms of design and not just go for broadly appealing, pretty much all Tudor's design choices lean to what is going to be most popular and most acceptable from or for the broader public. There's very little risk taking when it comes to their designs, but they are exactly that. Broadly appealing, good looking watches that are easily stylable. It's nothing crazy, nothing too wild, just good looking watches. And it's all for a good price. Tudor have definitely accelerated the move towards high quality at affordable prices. Their in-house Kinesi manufacturer provided excellent specs and accuracy at a price range where we were used to sourced base ETA calibers. Add to that, that again, for the price range, the tolerances on bracelets, bezels and crowns, the finishing and detailing cases was, of a very high standard compared to what else you could get out there. Companies like Longines and Oris have to some extent been playing catch up, but at Tudor, you could get everything all at once. Price, looks, popularity. 
Behind the scenes, I think there's also one thing in particular that you'd have really done well, and that's not marketing, as you might think. Their marketing is good. I've always had a tough time myself with the whole David Beckham collab, but overall, their marketing is good. No, the key is scale and mass production. Tudor has gone to great lengths to tell the world about their manufacture in Switzerland and the vault door that separates Kinesi from Tudor. Tudor has focused on being able to replicate and reproduce watches at scale. They're not messing around with hundreds of complications and variations of movements. Where possible, they'll even size down a movement to have it fit in a case rather than design a new movement from scratch. Technologies get reused and Kinesi, well, they sell variants of those same movements to other manufacturers like Norcane and Breitling. All this has been an absolute key to keeping the costs down and allowing Tudor to initially outpace competitors in terms of the quality of their offerings. It's changing, but for the longest time, much like Rolex, Tudor have had a fairly focused lineup, which again allows for scale, mass production, effective production, and also relatively speaking, little cannibalization between models. Tudor might still not be a financial powerhouse in the way that Longines or Rolex or Omega are, but they have really understood how to control costs and deliver offerings that tick all the right boxes. Tudor isn't perfect and not everything they've done is great, but I think it's fair to say that they have generally done a good job. There are though some things that can be improved upon. In terms of products, even Tudor has some less than stellar offerings. Specifically, I think that the general consensus is that the Tudor Royal just isn't as good or as relevant as it could be. Yeah, it's an integrated bracelet sports watch with 1970s styling, but the bezel and the bracelet, so many things just don't seem to appeal to the broader public. In Tudor's lineup, they are now positioned as women's watches, as a sort of Tudor pearl master, but I still think most would agree that this is a subpar offering. Second, the glamour dates, the 1926, and the rest of the dress watch line are forgettable at best. They don't get much attention in the press or online, and you could say it's because the Black Bay steal all the thunder, but honestly, I don't think these glamour watches would have much thunder either way, Black Bays or not. When it comes to the Royal and the glamour watches, it's not a huge problem. Dress type watches are not hugely popular these days. The 1908 from Rolex is likely not the most popular Rolex by any stretch of the imagination. And when you look at a brand like JLC, I do think they sometimes find it challenging that they have such a dress watch leaning catalog in today's market. They're doing fine for sure, but dive watches and sports watches are kind of what the general public want first and foremost. Tudor delivers this in spades, but having a good dress option to complement the Datejust or Oyster Perpetual style black bays would definitely, or probably at least, be a good idea. Finally, personal pet peeve, but I think that the Ranger isn't quite there yet. It's good, it's got a whole lot better than the previous version, but I think it needs just one more revision to really stand out as an offering against the likes of the Longines Spirit, which I think is far and away the better watch. It's a controversial opinion, I know. This is likely the biggest criticism I have currently of Tudor. Their positioning of all their models is a mess. We have a categorization which is the black bays, the sports watches, the classic watches, the women's watches, and the dive watches. Now here's some fun for you. The Tudor Ranger is a sports watch. Fair enough. The Royal is a sports watch and a women's watch. All the Pelagos models are sports watches, but none of the black bays are sports watches. The black bay chrono is not a sports watch. The black bays and Pelagos are all dive watches, except for the black bay 54, which is neither a diver nor a sports watch. It's only a black bay, at least when you click through the website. It's a mess and it matters. The reason it matters is this. When a company isn't clear on the positioning, two things happen. Customers get confused. And two, the manufacturer themselves start to lose track of what differentiates one product from another. Things start to overlap and over time this leads to a cluttered, messy and confusing product lineup. It's not just a question of how they present their products. Having a clear internal segmentation differentiation and clarity of product positioning makes for better product development and refinement decisions. I do sometimes get the feeling that Tudor are running the risk of losing track and losing that overview and just focusing on the individual products in isolation. How do I put it another way? Um, a producer can start with a product by asking the question, will people like this watch? Tudor are very good at that. The question that I don't think they're asking though is, how does this product line up with all our other products? It's not omega levels of messiness, but there's a risk that it can get a bit messy. Refinement. I think Tudor are totally aware of and actively working to refine their offerings. 
The newest Black Bay 41 has received an updated movement, a thinner case, and some aesthetic upgrades. The FXD Alinghi also has the classic BO1 movement, but they succeeded in making the case thinner than the other chronos using the same movement. We also know from the One Watch event that they have a gold big block Tudor that has another chronograph movement on the way. Hopefully it'll be thinner and more smooth in terms of winding experience. Tudor have added easy link bracelets and all sorts of other innovations and are slowly expanding metas to more and more watches. Tudor knows this and I'm sure there's a reasonably clear roadmap for rolling out the improvements and refreshing their lineup. This is also likely a controversial opinion. Tudor and Rolex have a lot of things in common. That's not the controversial part. The one thing though I want to highlight is that they are fundamentally boring. That's not a bad thing. Actually, I think it's a key to their success. The Submariner, the GMT, the Daytona, the Sea Dweller, the Datejust, they all use variations of the same case. All the watches are broadly appealing, hyper popular, middle of the road designs. There's no crazy skeletonization. There's no attempt to play around with you know, crazy case designs. You hardly ever see interesting materials and complications. Complications are expensive, so you hardly if ever see anything interesting with the rare exceptions of models like the Sky Dweller. Same for Tudor. Black Bay 41, 58, 54. Pelagos in black or blue. The FXD, its most weird or strange or controversial designs feature is its fixed lugs. It affects strap options, but visually it makes very little difference compared to a spring bar approach. It's safe. Then there were watches like the North Flag and the PO1. There aren't a lot of daring attempts from Tudor, and the ones that are didn't really succeed. The reason I bring up Rolex is to point out that I'm infinitely aware of the fact that being boring or appealing to the middle of the road is a very successful business model. Give people what they want and just stay consistent. It works, but I do believe that Tudor can't be fully like Rolex. They need to demonstrate to the market that they can come up with something a little bit out of the box every now and again. Now, Tudor are very mainstream in terms of product lineup and also price point. This though also means you have to consider how much you lean into what's popular right now and how much you try to push the envelope to see if you can stay cool. One of the things Longines I think are currently doing better than Tudor is precisely this. Longines have the new Hydro Conquests and the Spirits in multiple variants and they all go for that safe mass market segment. They're not as vintage, they're not as toolish as Tudor, but they're basically aiming for the same customers. Just like Tudor, they're also aware of the trend towards smaller watches. But Longines also have the Magitech, the Legend Diver, the Ultracron, and the Heritage Military. They're just a bit more daring, and I think that's a strength, allowing their designers to stretch their creative muscles a little bit more than just churning out the next standard dive watch. It's not that Tudor doesn't do this at all. There's the FXD, the Alinghi, the left-hand drive. There are models that try to be a little bit more daring, but they would do well to prioritize this daringness just a little bit more. Tudor's here to stay, this is clear. They've got a strong lineup and they're so deep into their relaunch that they're now refining models that have been around for 10, 13 years. The Black Bay 41 is in its third iteration and that model as an example is getting even better in terms of specs and design. It's thinner, it's got a better movement and design wise, it's ever so slightly less vintage in terms of styling reflecting that Tudor is moving with the times, modernizing their products to align with changing tastes in the market. For this video, I started putting together an Excel sheet where I mapped out every single release since 2010, the age of each watch relative to its most recent revision. The goal was to predict what is going to come next. I just couldn't find a way to illustrate this ridiculous Excel sheet in this video. The crux of it is this though. What's next is the boring phase. Again, controversial opinion. But think of it this way, Tudor has all the black bays it needs. The 41 is good, they don't need a 43 millimeter or a 45 millimeter. They have the midsize in the 58 and they have the small BB54. The GMT is established and it has its two color variants. The Pelagos has two sizes. The FXD has blue and black and a carbon model. From a lineup perspective, there's not really anything missing. They have a couple of chronos to choose from. They've got the dress watches that they need. To be clear, a blue dial Pelagos 39 would be cool and it's not an unlikely thing to be released. A white dial Black Bay Pro would be cool too. But apart from color variants and maybe something like a GMT Pelagos, there's not something missing in the broader lineup. There are no giant glaring gaps or omissions. Sure, we might see a big block chrono become part of the line and maybe even replace the Black Bay chrono, but they don't really need to bring out something new there either. A new North Flag would be cool too, but what would it do that the Ranger isn't doing in terms of serving a specific customer segment already? 
The prediction from my side is this. The time between truly new and exciting releases is going to get longer. That slight disappointment we all felt about the launch of the Black Dial FXD, where the marketing was far out of proportion when taking into account that it was more or less purely a colorway update, there's going to be more of that disappointment in the coming years. We're going to see those iterative improvements just like we see with Rolex. A movement upgrade here, a thinner case there, a minor adjustment to a dial or an hour hand, but it's small, iterative, incremental. Is that a bad thing? No. But we've just gotten so used to new knocking it out of the park releases from Tudor that we're really going to have to adjust our expectations to this new reality where the time between really new ideas is going to be drawn out. Now, as for me personally, I just bought this Tudor. I sold a Panerai Luminor Due and I used the money to finance the purchase of the Alinghi Red Bull Krona. I know, I even made a video about the Alinghi where I criticized it a little bit, Red Bull Riho and all, but I don't mind because this watch has just been such an experience to wear. It's just grown and grown on me ever since I saw it the first time at the dealer. So, like so many other Tudors, it's found its way to my wrist. What are your thoughts on the outlook for Tudor? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.